and get started. Uh, my name is Matt Rumsey. I work at the Sunlight Foundation and help um, organize the advisory committee on transparency events. I'm happy to welcome you here um, to this event um, on the future of FOIA, featuring some great experts on the Freedom of Information Act. Um, the advisory committee on transparency uh, is organized to share ideas with members of Congress, members specifically members of the Congressional Transparency Caucus, um, as well as policymakers around Washington. Um, our goal is to educate policymakers on transparency-related issues, problems, and solutions. Um, and the advisory committee is a project of the Sunlight Foundation, which is a nonpartisan nonprofit um, that is dedicated to using technology to improve government transparency. Um, I'm happy to welcome Ginger McCall down at that end of the table, uh, who's going to serve as the moderator for today's discussion. Um, Ginger is currently the Associate Director of the Electronic Privacy Information Center, or EPIC for short. Um, she's also the Director of EPIC's Open Government and IPIOP programs. Um, Ginger works on a number of issues, including consumer protection, open government, uh, national security, uh, and more, and specifically she oversees EPIC's FOIA, act, or FOIA lawsuits. Um, Ginger has been published in the New York Times and has co-authored several amicus briefs um, on privacy issues for the Supreme Court. Um, she's also spoken on privacy and open government issues in a variety of academic and conference settings. Ginger has provided excellent commentary for the New York Times, Washington Post, Fox News, NPR, MSNBC, uh, Wall Street Journal, Al Jazeera, and more. Um, Ginger graduated from Cornell Law School. Um, and graduated magna cum laude from the University of Pittsburgh with a BA, BA in English Literature. Um, while in law school, she interned at the American Civil Liber Liberties Union uh, and got her start at EPIC. Uh, Ginger was the president of the Cornell Law School National Lawyers Guild and was awarded Cornell's Freem Freeman Prize for Civil and Human Rights. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Ginger and she'll introduce the rest of our panelists and get the discussion going. Thanks, you, Matt. Um, I'm sure everyone will agree that we have a really great panel here. I'm just going to do brief introductions. Um, I'll do them in alphabetical order, although that's not the order we're sitting in and the order we will be speaking in. Um, Ali Amid is a professional staff member for the House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, where he works for Chairman Daryl Issa and covers a range of transparency issues. He previously worked for both Chairman Issa and former Committee Chairman Tom Davis as a Senior Communications Advisor. He has also worked as an aide in the Virginia State Senate and is a policy advisor to his hometown local government, where his office's records were frequently the subjects of State Freedom of Information Act requests. He is a graduate of the University of Virginia. Amy Bennett is the associate director at, the, at OpenTheGovernment.org, where she works extensively on the organization's policy issues, including improving access to government information and increasing openness and accountability of the federal government. In October 2013, Ms. Bennett coordinated the FOIA Summit, an event that brought together more than 40 advocates, journalists, litigators, and researchers to focus on issues preventing public requesters from using the Freedom of Information Act to get timely access to government records and to identify steps to address these problems. That was a great event, I actually remember it. Um, Ms. Bennett is the Secretary of the American Society of Access Professionals, ASAP, and has authored op-eds on issues related to FOIA that have appeared in papers throughout the country. Prior to joining the coalition, Ms. Bennett earned her master's in public policy from the Georgetown Public Policy Institute and a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from Tufts University. She also worked as a legislative assistant for Congresswoman Schakowsky. Krista Boyd serves as the Deputy Director of Legislation and Council for the Democratic Staff of the House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, where she most recently co collaborated with the committee's majority staff on critical oversight of the Justice Department's government-wide role in FOIA administration. Her oversight and legislative responsibilities include issues related to transparency, government operations, and the regulatory process. She assisted with drafting and negotiating legislation to improve the transparency of the federal government, including bills strengthening the Freedom of Information Act, improving the transparency of federal advisory committees, improving access to presidential and federal records, and the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act, which President Obama signed into law on November 27, 2012. Krista previously served as counsel for the United States Senator, Max Cleland. She is a graduate of Emory University School of Law and Florida State University. Corey Zarek is the policy advisor for, the open, for the open government at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. She works with federal executive branch agencies to develop and implement open government initiatives and coordinates outreach with non-government stakeholders. 
Previously, she was the staff attorney for the Federal Office of Government Information Services. That's OGIS. We'll talk a little bit more about them later. Uh, which serves the, as the Freedom of Information Act Ombudsman, and before that, the Freedom of Information Director for the Reporters Committee for the Freedom of Press, where she assisted journalists with open records and open meetings issues at the federal and state levels. Corey received her BA and JD from the University of Iowa, and also previously wrote for the Des Moines Register. So we're here today to talk about the future of FOIA reform. Uh, I guess probably it would be helpful for us to talk a little bit about what's happening in FOIA that it needs to be reformed. Uh, my background is as a FOIA litigator, so the thing that I see most, most frequently is an overuse of FOIA exemptions. Uh, FOIA contains nine exemptions. They protect national security materials, they protect privacy, uh, they protect government policy discussions. Um, but there are a few of these exemptions that are particularly overused. Uh, and one of them, we're going to, a few of them we're going to talk about today. Uh, the first one is exemption B5. This is the exemption that uh, covers inter or intra-agency memorandums or letters which would not be available by law to a party other than an agency in litigation with another agency. So this sweeps in all of those privileges that you would have in civil discovery. Um, most notably, uh, attorney work product privilege and deliberative process privilege. And what we've seen is the agencies have been really using this exemption quite a bit. Um, they use it to protect all kinds of policy discussions, and that's a proper use of this exemption. It was created to protect the candor of the agencies, to allow agency officials within the agency and among agencies to have candid decisions about policy and what they should do about policy. Um, but what I've seen in my cases recently is that the agencies have been using B5 to protect conversations that they have with outside contractors, to protect purely factual materials, not policy discussions, purely factual materials. We had a case where we were asking for the radiation readouts from the body scan machines. And the agency, uh, in that case, Department of Homeland Security, had been trying to keep that information from us saying that it was a part of their policy discussions. And these were research studies by outside scientists. So B5 is a particularly pressing problem. B3 uh, is the exemption that sweeps in all other statutes. So if Congress creates a statute and says this statute exempts, uh, one good example is the National Security Agency from providing any information to outside parties about its organization or activities. Those statutes are under exemption three, and we've seen a, a lot of these statutes being created, especially after the Miller decision uh, which was a Supreme Court decision that vacated uh, an exemption that agencies had previously relied on quite extensively. Uh, so we've seen a lot of new B3 statutes come out. Uh, usually they're hidden in larger bills. We don't necessarily know about them ahead of time. They're hard to identify and hard to track. Uh, so exemptions five and three are particularly pressing matters. Um, this year we also saw a case, this was a case by um, Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, where an agency tried to say that an acknowledgement letter was in fact a determination under the statute, and that would start, it would toll the statute of limitations for a requester to appeal the agency's decision. Uh, for those of you who haven't made a FOIA request, typically you'll make a request to an agency, and the agency will send you back a form letter. And the form letter will say, we've received your request, here's a file number for your request, uh, we'll get to it when we get to it, basically. Um, and the agencies were trying to say that for the purpose of the statute, that acknowledgement is, is itself a determination. Meanwhile, in the FOIA statute itself, it says in order for a response to be a determination, the agency has to tell you whether or not it, that it is identified documents, it has to tell you whether or not it's going to give you those documents, and if it's not, what exemptions it's withholding them under, and it has to advise you of your right to appeal. So. This case went up, uh, the DC District Court made a very bad decision and upheld the agency's argument that uh, an acknowledgement is a determination. It went up to the DC Circuit Court for appeals uh, and there that decision got overturned, thankfully. But you can see these sort of aggressive stances that agencies have been taking. Um, there's been a shift in what exemptions are used after Milner, which is another thing that needs to be addressed. There's a filling in of new B3 exemptions. Uh, the regulations that agencies have, each agency is allowed to create its own regulations to implement the FOIA. Those regulations are often sorely outdated. Um, and I think Amy's going to talk a little bit about 
uh, some of the proposals for updates to regulations, which are actually worse than the existing outdated regulations. Um, there's been a general, I think, within the transparency community, we agree on this, a general failure to implement uh, the Open Government Act of 2007 reforms and to implement President Obama's stated transparency goals. Um, there are a lot of processing problems with fees and media status groups getting denied media status. Um, one example I have heard while we were at a FOIA meeting was uh, PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. Uh, now PETA has a newsletter, they actually have a print magazine, and yet they were told by the agency that they were not a news media requester for the purposes of the FOIA, which denies them the ability to get favorable fee status. It means that they're going to have to pay hundreds, potentially thousands, or I think in this case tens of thousands of dollars in fees in order to be able to obtain the documents that they want. Um, now, the Obama administration has said that there would be a presumption of openness, that there would be an emphasis on discretionary disclosure, but we've generally failed to see that. Um, and on top of this, uh, there's been a lack of support generally for the Office of Government Information Services, or OGIS. Uh, so these are some of the problems that we're confronting at this moment. Um, and we've assembled a really expert panel here to talk about you know, any other problems that they've encountered and also some solutions that, that might be on the horizon. So uh, without any further discussion, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Krista Boyd. Sunshine Week to shine a light on the importance of transparency, and it's something that I hope that we can keep in mind throughout the year. You know the importance of this issue, and that we keep the attention on um, improving not just FOIA but all of our transparency laws um, throughout the year. And um, I feel like, as a staffer who handles these issues, it gets a little frustrating that I feel like we get the attention during one week, and then it sort of fades away a little bit during the rest of the year. Um, but it's really wonderful to have this event and to be able to, to talk about FOIA and how we can improve um, implementation of the law. Um, I, I work for a ranking member, Cummings is the ranking member of the Oversight Government Reform Committee. The Oversight Committee has legislative jurisdiction over FOIA as well as other transparency laws. And rank, the ranking member, Cummings, um, is very pleased to be co-sponsoring um, H.R. 1211, which is the FOIA Act, um, with Chairman Issa, and it's um, a bill that will um, make important improvements to FOIA. It is aimed at being um, not the end-all be-all with the perfect solution to everything, but taking issues that have come before the committee through our oversight efforts and through comments that we've heard from outside groups um, and FOIA requesters, and trying to address some of the the issue, some of those issues in a way that can garner bipartisan support and hopefully um, make it through the process quickly. Um, the bill passed the House um, by a recorded vote of 410 to nothing, which seems to be a strong endorsement of its bipartisan origins and bipartisan intent. Um, and you know that's really rare that we. I mean, often bills passed by voice vote, but it isn't often that we get a recorded vote where no, no member votes no. Um, so that's really exciting, and we're hopeful that it, it will um, get attention in the Senate and, and keep moving. So one of the important provisions that's in that bill that I think would be helpful to talk about today is adding to the FOIA statute and the presumption of openness. You know, that's something as you know, we talked about in developing the bill FOIA doesn't anywhere in the statute actually say that agencies should implement the law with the presumption of disclosure um, versus the presumption of withholding information. I think as a principle, that's really important, and it's important that um, agencies have a clear message that regardless of who is in the White House, that that is, um, you know, the in that is Congress's intent under the statute, so that the agencies implement a law with a presumption of disclosing information to the public. Um, another component of the bill is 
the addition of an advisory committee on open government. That's something that was added to the bill um, based on comments from outside groups and FOIA advocates. Um, and I know that you know there's the initiation under the president's initiative of a advisory committee on FOIA. I think that's you know something else would be helpful to, to talk about is you know how those things can complement each other. We don't view the bill as being in any way at odds with you know this initiative. We think that's actually something that the bill could bolster um, the continuation of that committee. And um, that's you know something that would be really helpful to have feedback to agencies, um, you know, from FOIA experts and how we can Im better implement FOIA. Um, and I would like to touch on a couple of other things because I know we'll probably talk more about the bill and I don't want to take everything away from him. Um, but there are other um, transparency measures that the <coughs> committee's been working on that I just want to throw out there that aren't FOIA related, but they do work hand in hand with FOIA. One is the Presidential Records Act amendments. That's another bill that um, the House passed that we're hopeful that the Senate will act on. And that would put into statute a set procedure um, for releasing presidential records. Um, right now, it's basically been left to whoever's in the White House for them to interpret how their records are, you know, how, not their records, but how president's records are managed um, and how they can assert privilege. And we think it's important that that not be left to the whim of who's in the White House, but that that be in the statute to have a clear process to ensure that records are released in a timely manner and that a president can't arbitrarily sit on information without um, asserting privilege, just you know, hold on to the records. The records should be released in a timely way. And it's important that pre the assertion of privilege be personal to a president, that it can't be um, passed on to someone else. Um, so that's one, another bill that's been, that has passed the House and something else we've, the committee just acted on is the Federal Records Modernization Act and that's one to modernize the Federal Records Act to um, provide more flexibility in the statute to make the um, Federal Register more easily available online. Um, and then another one, uh, another bill we just recently, um, the committee just approved is the whistle, it's called the All Circuit Review Extension Act and that's a review aimed at um, a bill aimed at um, bolstering the rights of whistleblowers. And that's something we don't always talk about, whistleblowers hand in hand with FOIA. But if you think about it, whistleblowers are on the inside and have access to the information to expose waste, fraud, and abuse within agencies. So it's, they play an important role in promoting transparency. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? My name's Ali Ahmed, and I work for Chairman Ice on the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Uh, and like uh, Krista said, right now we are very pleased, and both of our bosses are very pleased to work together on HR 1211, uh, not only in introducing it and moving it through the House, but also the sort of the years of oversight work that went into crafting the legislation. Um, uh, she mentioned some of the key provisions of the bill, some of the others that I think sort of bear mentioning now. Um, it contains provisions to strengthen right to disclosure, um, uh, affirm affirmation of the need for a portal for making requests <coughs> to all agencies. Um, and one that I think Chairman Knight is maybe most excited about is uh, allowing the FOIA Ombudsman, OGIS, to directly communicate with Congress, not through OMB. We think that's uh, kind of important to, when you, you think of the term Ombudsman, that's very important to that rule, that it be able to take issues of concern uh, directly to the people, in this case, through their representatives in Congress. Um, and I'm very looking forward to answering questions about that bill and about potentially some other reform efforts going forward, and maybe most importantly hearing your ideas for what's necessary to come next. Um, I'd like to take a panelist's privilege here just to plug a uh, non-FOIA-related transparency caucus event. In addition to being the chair of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee, uh, my boss, Chair Lysa, is the co-chair of the Congressional Transparency Caucus, along with Mike Quigley of Illinois, who uh, serves in the Appropriations Committee. And next Tuesday, March 25th, at uh, 1 p.m., uh, they'll be hosting a briefing on uh, open data and job creation. Um, we'll feature panelists, uh, including Hudson Hollister from the Data Transparency Coalition, 
Joel Gurin, the author of Open Data Now, uh, Chad Sandstedt, um, the founder of a company called Tagnify, and Kevin Davis from Find the Best. We'll, we'll feature him. <laughs> so uh, we're really looking forward to that event. Um, it, open data is an issue that's obviously near and dear to the chairman's heart and something that he sees as integrally related to um, some of the provisions in the FOIA reform bill that the House just passed. Another um, bill, Chris mentioned several bills that Chairman Issa and Reckon are coming to working on uh, in addition to FOIA reform. Another one is the Data Act, which passed the House um, late last year, and Chairman Carper has indicated that the Senate is working very hard on being able to move something to, and so we're uh, very encouraged that we could possibly get two major bipartisan transparency bills through the House and the Senate this year and to the President's desk. So it's a, it's a good time to be advancing this type of legislation. Yes. Um, hello, happy Sunshine Week. <laughs> Thank you to the Advisory Committee on Transparency and the Sunlight Foundation for putting this event together. I'm so glad to be here. Um, and thank you to Ginger for the, the nice welcome. Um, my name is Corey Zarek, and I am with the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, um, a mouthful. OSTP, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, um, oversees the government's domestic open government efforts, and which of course open government is lots of things, including FOIA. And one thing I work on with my colleagues um, over at the White House is the Open Government Partnership, our uh, United States membership in this 60 plus nation conglomeration of countries that puts out open government national action plans uh, every two years to report on what countries are up to and what countries' goals are for furthering open government where they are. So the United States has put out now its second open government national action plan. The first came out in 2011 and the second in December of 2013. You can find both of these plans on whitehouse.gov slash open. Hopefully many of you in this room uh, who share my fervor for open government have already taken a look at the open government national action plan. Um, so I'm just going to focus on the efforts that relate to FOIA today based on the, uh, the future of FOIA and where we're headed with all of these various efforts. The first national action plan contains two specific FOIA related efforts. And both um, were implemented and continue to be carried forward in various ways. The first was to create a, pro a professionalized job series within the government for FOIA professionals. The Office of Personnel Management, OPM, um, did create this series a couple years ago, and now many federal FOIA professionals have been moved into this specialized job series, the Government Information Specialist Series, 0306, if you're keeping square at home. Uh, to make sure that FOIA professionals are getting the specialized attention and training and um, resources that they need to do their jobs. So we're continuing to work with OPM and with agencies to implement this and refine it. The other uh, initiative in the first Open Government National Action Plan was to move, te move technology more into FOIA and find ways to use technology to make FOIA more efficient for requesters and for agencies as well. And that's a process that is underway, certainly has begun, um, and will carry forward as long as there is technology, I'm sure. So uh, a couple of, of highlights from the first now National Action Plan with technology was a lot of enhancements and improvements to FOIA.gov. We see a lot more ways to search and sort information um, on that site and great contact information for the folks in agencies who you might be looking to reach out to if you are um, checking up on your requests. FOIA Online is another resource that launched during that time period, and there are um, several agencies, and more joining every day, who participate in this centralized FOIA request portal. Um, it's something that was started up by the Department of Commerce, the EPA, the National Archives, and some other agencies who partnered together to launch this system that several other agencies have now participated in. We hear great things about FOIA online from requesters, and it serves as a really good um, model for what's out there in terms of centralized requests. Going forward, our second national action plan uh, introduced five more initiatives in the FOIA space that we are really excited about and are all actually underway right now. Um, some of 
these may sound familiar to you as their efforts that we've been talking about for a while in different ways and are now you know, at the forefront and part of our international commitment to get done. One of those is to launch a federal FOIA advisory committee. So a committee that meets under the Federal Advisory Committee Act, so a real FACA committee. Um, so this FOIA FACA will, so many F words, um, this FOIA FACA will live within the National Archives um, and is being put together by the Office of Government Information Services, OGIS, my, my former home. Um, and OGIS is apparently inundated with interest in this committee, inundated in a good way. There have been dozens and dozens and dozens of resumes appearing in the OGIS inbox from folks within government who'd like to participate and folks from outside of government who have FOIA interest and expertise who would like to participate. So I know OGIS is putting all of this together now and working with the Maine National Archives to get this committee launched. The committee is expected to meet up to four times a year. Meetings will be open to the public and we anticipate that they will be well attended um, for a FACA. So we look forward to hearing what that committee takes up and uh, different sort of problems they work to solve and, and recommendations that they have to share with the rest of government. A second initiative from the second National Action Plan was to improve FOIA training. And the Justice Department is um, about to launch its new uh, e-learning modules that will be publicly available on the DOJ website and will address different targeted training audiences. Um, the first, I believe, is going to be geared toward FOIA professionals, who the folks who work on FOIA every day, and provide them with very thorough e-learning web training where they can, um, at their on, on their own time, get the information that they need in order to do their jobs well. The great thing about the DOJ training is it's not geared just toward these FOIA professionals, but they're also putting together a module for regular government employees, because FOIA, we know, is everyone's responsibility. And there are a lot of people who start in the government who don't hear word one about FOIA until you know weeks or months later. We want to be sure that federal employees know what FOIA is and know that they have a responsibility to FOIA in some way and know what that responsibility is. So the DOJ training, uh, another module, will be geared toward folks who have just come into government to explain to them their role in the process. Uh, a third module will be geared toward more senior folks in agencies who maybe have been uh, around for a while and will help them see their role in the FOIA process and how it's very important to have uh, strong support from senior leadership within agencies to help FOIA work better. A third initiative that we are working on in, that came out of the second National Action Plan is um, to improve internal processes. So there is a lot that goes on on the back end in government. You heard that I came from the nonprofit world outside of government, and when I joined the government, I, I, my mind was blown when I realized what all goes into processing a FOIA request, or the FOIA process generally. Um, there's a lot that's there, and there are a lot of places, we all know, where FOIA sees some hiccups. And this goal to improve internal processes is going to be led up by DOJ, where they will host a series of workshops and bring together folks within government who have already solved some of FOIA's hardest problems and get them together to share their strategies with one another and come up with takeaways that we can share across government for ways that other agencies can build on those same solutions and implement them within their own agencies. So the goal would be to have, have this, this team of fixers come together and share how they solve the problem and then provide some best practices and takeaways to share with agencies and the public on you know, how we would recommend agencies um, tackle these things. The fourth uh, effort that's underway under the National Action Plan is to examine FOIA regulations. This is something we have all heard a lot about for quite some time, and I know it's um, an issue we share an interest in. Every agency adopts its own FOIA regulations, as you know, and agencies update those regulations um, at various intervals. There are many areas in FOIA that are fairly uniform across the board, many parts of the process that can mirror one another or be parallel within agencies. And the goal with this effort is to identify those areas and put together a common FOIA regulation or a model regulation so that all agencies can build from that set of core principles as they enact and adopt new regulations. So this is a process that's just getting started. We will want a lot of feedback from all of you as users of FOIA and observer, observers of FOIA 
to uh, share more about your experiences and help us be sure that this model common reg is really useful for everyone, agencies and public alike. And then the final uh, goal or future of FOIA initiative that I will mention um, is my favorite and I'm really excited about it. We've committed to launching a single request portal across all of government. So this is intended to be one place where all requesters can go to file their requests that will on the back end go back out to all agencies. Um, this is a bit of an involved process and we really want to do it right. So it will start with a consultation period where the government team is working with all of its users. So fellow feds who are going to be using the system every day, requesters who will be contributing to this system in their own ways, um, anyone who is interested in being a part of this process, folks over here on the Hill who would love to hear uh, more about it and give us their suggestions and contributions. We intend to um, really do as much homework as we can to make sure that we launch into this with the best possible solution for everyone involved. Um, there are, as I just mentioned, other solutions available in government that are very similar. FOIA Online has been around and been very successful for some time, and it will be a huge part of this process as well, looking at what FOIA Online offers and bringing those folks in to determine whether that might be the best way forward. Um, the State Department has a, a brand shiny new system that is working very well for them that they really um, seem to enjoy. And so we'll be doing a lot of learning and gathering information from government systems, from non-government systems, tools like the, the MuckRap request site, um, the FOIA project. Lots of non-government folks have created similar tools. Um, so there is a lot of information gathering to be done, and that's the phase we're in right now. Um, and we're looking for input from any of you who would like to share it. So really excited that we've committed to launching this, this consolidated portal system and um, very enthusiastic about all of these initiatives that we are going to continue carrying forward in the coming years. Thanks. Thanks. So I also want to start with thanking the Advisory Committee on Transparency and the Sunlight Foundation for having us here today. I also want to thank all my fellow panelists and Ginger and everybody who's in this room really for uh, caring about making the Freedom of Information Act actually work for the public. Uh, you know, we, I feel that uh, in the last couple of years, we've had some really good things happen on FOIA. The, the uh, commitments that were included in the new National Action Plan, we, we are very hopeful about. The fact that the House passed a bill is uh, very great. Uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee had a great oversight hearing earlier this week, and I think that this is a real sign and a growing consensus that it's time to, to really do something about the Freedom of Information Act and make it work. Uh, so I'm much more hopeful today about the future of FOIA uh, than I was perhaps a year or so ago. Now, that being said, let's do a little bit of a reality check. Uh, FOIA is not working. Uh, you know, despite the fact that uh, the administration has told agencies to work with the presumption of openness, and for those of you who don't know, the presumption of openness just means that when an agency is processing a request, they should work on the assumption that the, that the record should be released to the public. So despite the fact that they've been told that this is how they should uh, process requests, according to the government's own statistics and, and in a recent AP analysis, exemption use is actually going up. The Center for Effective Government just released a new report card where they looked at, um, at how agencies are processing FOIA requests they also looked at uh, agency FOIA websites and at the rules that they're using for, uh, for how they process requests. And they found that uh, more than half of the agencies that they looked at actually got a failing grade. That's not good. Uh, you know, and also, if you look at the National Security Archive, they did a, an audit of, uh, FOIA, of, of agency FOIA regulations. And so, for those of you that don't know, Agency FOIA re regulations are basically the operating angle that agencies use for how they process requests. So the National Security Archive found that uh, 56, eight, last year, their results were 56 agencies out of the 99 that have FOIA regulations hadn't been updated since Congress changed the law in 2007. So if agencies haven't updated the regulations, they're not executing the law the way that Congress has told them to, more, li more likely than not. Uh, their, their more recent results, they just released on Monday, and it's 50 agencies. So uh, we have a little bit of improvement, but that's still more, that's still more than half. It, of agencies have regulations that, that don't reflect the recent changes to the law. And you know, and if I asked my friends at the Sunlight Foundation to help me put together one of those like really cool word clouds on uh, like my conversations with other FOIA requesters, I think you get some really negative words to show up. You'd have words like delay, 
unhelpful um, and just confusing and unworkable. So, you know, while we appreciate everything that's going on, I think we have a lot of work to do. I want to start with um, just briefly mentioning some areas where we really agree with um, some things that, with some, with some steps that are included in both the House and in the administration's new commitments. Uh, first of all, a centralized portal. We think that makes a lot of uh, sense for requesters. Uh, you know, you shouldn't have to go to 99, 99 or I don't even know how many websites there are because some agencies have multiple websites for, for their different programs. So there are hundreds of places that you have to go to make a request. There should be one place where you go and you can make a new request, you can file your appeal, and hopefully you can even get your documents there. That would be really good for requesters. Um, we uh, also appreciate that uh, both the House and the administration are looking at regulations because that's something that's really important. If, if the law is gonna, if people in the agency are gonna carry out the law the way that it's supposed to, um, uh, it's a no-brainer to if the law has changed to have them update regulations again. And we also, you know, uh, are really hopeful about the common regulations. The same thing that reason that Corey, you know, has spelled out. It would just simplify things and um, make it easier for, for requesters. We do have some concerns, though, because uh, regulations can either be what, written in a way that help requesters or they can be written in a way that hurt requesters by giving them very short times to file an appeal. Um, you know, the Department of Justice, who is leading uh, the, the effort to put together the, the common regulation, actually uh, made a proposal last year where, most famously, they were going to be allowed to lie to requesters about the uh, existence of documents. It also made it harder to qualify as a news media requester, and did a number of things that were anti-requesters. So, you know, we, we definitely hope that we see more requester-friendly common way of regulations coming out of that. And then, um, of course, the open government community loves the idea of a federal advisory committee that includes the open government community, because we would like there to be some sort of a lasting body where we can continue to work with um, people like Corey uh, and with other people in the agencies that really love and care about the, the public's right to know uh, in, a lasting, in a lasting way. So that's where we agree. But you know, as I said earlier, making uh, FOIA work for requesters and work in the way that Congress intended it is, is going to take a lot more. And Ali, you, you asked for ideas for uh, what else should, should Congress look at. I uh, and the open government community have a lot, yeah. but I'm going to limit myself to five. Okay. So I'm going to talk about five areas where um, Congress, are really, there are areas that are really ripe for some, some congressional attention. So the first one is on Exemption 5. As Ginger uh, mentioned, this is the exemption that's supposed to uh, cover, among other things, the deliberative process and, um, and the attorney work client privilege. So, Agencies, though, uh, with some, with some uh, help from the Judiciary Branch, have uh, begun to use this exemption in a way that it covers essentially anything that is in a final, final version of a, of a, of a report. Uh, and that's definitely not the way that Congress in, intended <coughs> for that exemption to be used. And we think that uh, Congress can certainly amend that exemption so that it more closely narrows what actually exists in the, in the civil discovery context. Uh, the next uh, issue is on the Office of Government Information Services, uh, which uh, is Corey's former home. We also have the director of the office here. For those of you who don't know, uh, in, the office was created in 2007, in the 2007 amendments, and it was given two charges. Number one, it's supposed to act as the FOIA mediator, so they get involved in actual disputes between requesters uh, and the agency, and there, there are lots of them, as you can imagine, lots of disputes. Uh, and second, the office is charged with uh, reviewing agency FOIA compliance and with recommending changes to Congress and the President. So, as Raleigh said, the House bill does address the, the, the part about uh, making it easier for OGIS to actually make the recommendations, but there are two other pieces to really making, giving OGIS the tools that it needs to actually help requesters that we think are really important. Number one, resources. So they have a staff of seven. They have seven people that help, like, thousands of FOIA requesters in each of the 99 FOIA, FOIA, uh, FOIA offices in the agencies. So they clearly need more people. And they also need, um, it took them quite a while to even be able to get a high-speed scanner. So they need, they, need, um, they, need to, they need more resources to just be able to do their job uh, and, and to have enough people to, 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 meet that, to meet the needs. And the second is on authority. So right now, uh, OGIS has to basically rely on the goodwill of an agency who is in a dispute with the requester in order to provide mediation services. 
Congress should uh, start quit. Uh, change that statute so that uh, it, so that the agency was a compelled to actually participate in mediation, and uh, if 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 OGIS needs to review any documents, they should be able to require agencies to hand over any documents that, that are uh, cogent to the case. The third area is on exemption three. So as as uh, Ginger mentioned, this is kind of the catch-all for you. It, it covers anything that is required to be withheld under other statutes. And as, as Ginger also said, these things normally pop up in great big appropriations or authorization bills that are must-pass pieces, pieces of legislation. And because they don't amend FOIA, uh, committees like the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee and the Senate Judiciary Committee, who have really expertise the public's right to know, never review these things. Uh, so if we have a little bit more oversight on uh, how they're created and how they're used at the agency, we can make sure that any new provisions that are, that are added are really narrow, needed, and um, they really protect the public's right to know. So the first, the fourth thing, uh, and I swear I'm almost done, <laughs> is, is uh, putting in place systems that require agencies to make more information available, uh, more information available that um, it, that's meaningful to the public without anybody having to actually file a FOIA request. So you know, I'm, I'm going to give you two areas, two examples of where this could work. One is on spending information. So contracts are uh, commonly, uh, people file, file FOIA for contracts all the time. We should have that information. It, we shouldn't have to file a FOIA request and then wait for somebody to process it. We, we have a right to know what kind of terms the government's using to, to spend taxpayer dollars. So those should go ahead and those should be, those should be freely uh, available online as, as soon as possible. And then the other, the other place where this could work is on um, ethics information. So every agency, collect some kind of information that would help us understand who's trying to influence their decisions, be it the calendars of top officials, visitor letter, visitor, visitor, uh, visitor logs, or even just you know, flat out lobbying forms. So agencies really should go ahead and pull that, put all that information online and go ahead and let sunlight be the best, the best disinfectant that, that it should be. Uh, and then the, the last issue that I just want to really briefly raise is um, Congress really needs to push back on the very idea that anybody in Congress should have to file a FOIA. Uh, if if uh, a member of Congress needs uh, information from an agency in order to conduct oversight, they shouldn't go to the back of the FOIA line. <laughs> 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 Thank opportunity to respond to each other if anyone has anything that they want to say or add on to something that anyone else had to say. Then I have a few questions, then we'll open it up for audience questions. Any comments? All right. I have lots of questions. Yeah. Um, so there are a lot of great events going on this week. Yesterday I was at a FOIA Day event. Uh, actually, Miriam, I think you were there too, and probably several of the panelists as well. Um, over at uh, AU's Washington College of Law. And one of the things that came up there over and over again, because a substantial portion of the audience was actually Government Freedom of Information Act officers, was the discussion about the culture of secrecy. Uh, and particularly when you're dealing with a, a national security related agency or in the intelligence community, there are a lot of incentives to withhold documents. There are a lot of incentives to maintain secrecy. So what is it that, that we can do, either in the transparency community or in Congress or uh, in the administration itself or elsewhere, to sort of change that culture and to encourage more openness? It is simply adding language on the presumption of disclosure in a bill enough, or, or do we really need to do something else to confront that kind of culture of secrecy? secrecy? Well, uh, I guess I can refer. I think adding uh, language on the presumption of disclosure into statute is important. I think it's not enough, um, but it's, uh, it's necessary but not sufficient to change the culture. Um, it's a bit of an intergenerational struggle mm -hmm. to change government's culture on more than just the issues of secrecy, but also certain uh, you know aspects of being more entrepreneurial and how you achieve your mission, um, uh, things like that. Uh, leveraging technology to handle the sort of back-end jobs um, of which certain aspects of FOIA processing will fall um, so that more of the taxpayer resources can be put on the front line to deliver services 
Um, it's kind of the stuff that uh, David Walker talks about, Paul Light talked about it, uh, Mr. Issa and Mr. Cummings have held, I think, three or four hearings now over the past four years about those sorts of big cultural changes in government. Um, I think maybe one of the most important things would be, as Amy talked about, as the bill uh, starts to get at is proactive disclosure and ensuring that more of the records that people want are just made public uh, as a part of doing business. You know, that'll change the culture when people start to see that what we do becomes public. This, and, and help to reflect the idea that FOIA doesn't create the public's right to have this information. It's the mechanism by which they can access it. It's their information. That's why they have a right to have it. I wanted to second actually something that Amy had said about uh, proactive disclosure and contracts. Um, so at Epic, one of the most frequent categories of records that we request is contracts. Um, we'll see a privacy impact assessment about the Department of Homeland Security acquiring some new surveillance technology, or a news story about, uh, or a press release from the company itself saying there's a new technology, it's being acquired by the government. Look online, and we can't find any of the contracts, the statements of work, the technical specifications, and it ends up eating up a lot of our time to make that request, a lot of the agency's time to process it, and even the court's time to process our litigation when we don't get a response from the agency to our FOIA request. So that, I think, is, is one of those big categories of documents. It's the low-hanging fruit for proactive disclosure. Contracts, technical specifications, statements of work, that sort of, uh, the explanation of where our money is going, uh, what the government is spending the money on. And I know at, at the Sunlight Foundation, when I was there, we filed a FOIA lawsuit for, for contracts and spending data. And one of the things that the agency tried to redact was actually the names of the contracting officers, which if you are a government oversight organization, you want to know who it is that is contracting with these companies so that you can go back, you can look at the data, you can analyze it and look for patterns. Is there a particular contracting officer who's granting a lot of contracts to a particular company that might raise some red flags about potential corruption issues? So I think for a lot of reasons, these contracts are, are one of the document sets that really should be proactively disclosed. Uh, Ginger, if I can jump in on, on the original, kind of to jump back to your original question about changing the culture. I, I would agree that there is always room for improvement, but I have been really heartened as you know a fairly new Fed, I've been in government for nearly five years now, to um, to see the kind of dedication to open government and to FOIA and to doing the right thing that I've seen. Um, I think that I've, I've been working in this space for close to 10 years now, and it was, I, I'm recalling a time when government folks didn't necessarily get excited about Sunshine Week and weren't coming up with their own Sunshine Week events, weren't participating in Sunshine Week events. Um, I have been attending the American University event for several years, and I, I didn't make it over yesterday, sadly, but I'm surprised to hear that the audience is mostly government folks. I remember the early years when it was completely all of the non-government individuals. So I think some of these things suggest that culture is slowly changing. Um, there are a lot of initiatives that have been underway during this administration over the last few years, I think, to show how much more open agencies want to be. Um, the Department of Justice and OGIS have been hosting a FOIA requester roundtable series every quarter for the last few years, bringing in um, requesters and agency folks to talk about these issues in an open, safe place where they can discuss um, things. DOJ has been running FOIA town halls open to the public to bring the public in to discuss issues and hear about what um, what they're up to. And you know, back to Sunshine Week, I have I sort of did an open call to my agency colleagues to hear what everyone was up to for Sunshine Week, and I was bombarded by things. And that's such a great. Um, that's such a great thing to hear. Agencies are scheduling a lot of their internal trainings this week, um, or their meetings, and kind of coinciding things with Sunshine Week to make sure that folks know about this issue of FOIA and how important FOIA is. Several agencies are uh, modeling what the National Archives started to do a couple of years ago and issuing a memorandum to their employees reminding them that FOIA is everyone's responsibility of the importance of FOIA. Um, and Onara did that this week, Department of Transportation, Treasury, uh, DHS, probably some others. Um, agencies have created really cool, all right, cool, <laughs> relative <laughs> <audience>. um, <laughs> FOIA signage. 
manage to put up all over the agencies, you know, reminding folks about, you know, sunlight's a good thing, transparency is good. So there are all these new initiatives that I'm quite sure weren't happening, you know, some time ago. So I do see culture changing. I know it's not changing necessarily as fast as some of us would like it, but I have been very heartened to see all of these good things coming. And we want your suggestions to make sure that they keep coming um, in, in ways that we can do that from the inside. You know, much appreciated. Oh, oh wait. Uh, so I think that changing the culture, it has to go beyond FOIA. Uh, and, I, and I do have to give this administration a lot of credit for putting more effort into actually trying to change the culture than I, I think we've ever seen before. Uh, so the advisory committee on, or the open government working group, sorry, way too many, <laughs> way too many groups with open government in their title, including mine. But um, so, the, so the working group on open government uh, has been meeting for, for quite a while. They recently, uh, it's an it's a interagency working group. They occasionally met with us outsiders every once in a while. They recently committed to meeting with us quarterly. Uh, so I think that's, that's a really good way to begin to build some bridges. And I, and I think that that's also really a key on starting to change the culture uh, in FOIA and, without, and for agencies in general. A lot of time agencies view outsiders as the enemy. Uh, so it's creating spaces where uh, the agency, agency officials actually interact with the public uh, and, and they kind of begin to learn that we're in this together. Uh, and, and as soon as we start seeing each other as partners rather than as enemies, then we can uh, start building a better government. Thank you, Amy. I should have mentioned that. Um, <laughs> I'll also mention that that interagency working group, at the suggestion of our non-government colleagues, um, recently launched, or I should say is in the process of launching because I'm slow with technology, um, is launching a new listserv where, uh, which isn't that hard enough, um, is launching a new listserv where folks from outside of government can collaborate, collaborate with federal colleagues working on open government issues. And um, you can find it by looking for U.S. Open Government in Google Groups um, and ask to join it that way. You can send me a direct email. I'll give you my info afterward if you're interested. Be sure to add you. We're looking forward to this being a new way to collaborate with one another. Um, you know, and maybe not a face-to-face -face space, but still a pretty good, collaborative, working, productive, safe place. I think from the congressional standpoint, that's. Statutory changes are important when they're necessary. Um, like Ali said, I think adding in a presumption of disclosure is a great and important step. But nothing takes the place of congressional oversight from the legislative branch's perspective on shining a light on the over secrecy. Um, I think you know we can find examples, and I think it's most effective when it doesn't just come in the form of a general hearing on transparency, but when it comes on shining a light on a specific example of over secrecy. You know, one example that readily comes to mind is when the Department of Defense was refusing to disclose information about water quality near Camp Lejeune, and the advocacy from those, you know, the, the members of Congress who represent that area in the state of North Carolina and the constituencies around Camp Lejeune and veterans advocacy groups, I mean, that their um, passion and drive to get that information, I mean, led to the disclosure of information that otherwise wouldn't have been disclosed. And I think having that specific oversight makes a big difference. The Oversight Committee has, for years and years, um, had oversight efforts over the Department of Homeland Security's overuse of sensitive security information. Um, designation, and as you were talking about body scanner readouts earlier, it made me think about that. So I think that you know the oversight of those specific issues shine the light in a way that just general discussions or statutory changes are never going to get at in the same way. So how do you think the recent discussions on national security and transparency surrounding the Snowden revelations have influenced thinking on FOIA? Um, in Congress and the administration, and, and even internationally in the um, open government partnership. So I think for, from our perspective, it shines an even bigger, brighter light on the need to fix Exemption 5, uh, because that's what's been used to withhold um, the memos from the Department of Justice's Office of Legal Counsel. Uh, so these are, these are memos, uh, the department uh, says that they're, you know, they're, they're the advice of the president's lawyers to the president, 
But in reality, what these are, are that they set that they are interpreting the law. Uh, they, uh, they, the, the opinions just determine whether or not what, what the government what program is, is legal. Uh, and I think that in recent years, you know, especially on surveillance, we found out that through these opinions, they, the programs that would not be uh, allowable under a plain reading of the law uh, were considered perfectly legitimate and fine. Uh, so uh, there, there definitely is a need for the, for the public to be able to understand uh, and know how the government is, is not, only, not only what the words of the law are, but how those, those laws are being interpreted and, and what they're allowed to do uh, because of these interpretations. Yeah, I'm just piggybacking off of that a little bit. Interpretations are uh, you know, quintessential to understanding what the law actually says in terms of what it's doing right now. Um, I, I, I'd say it, in some ways it's a problem that goes beyond just the, as we talked before, how about it goes by being a bigger and bigger problem. This pr particular aspect of it goes beyond just the surveillance state because um, I, I know we had a considerably hard time getting information from the Office of Legal Counsel on an opinion on whether or not the Postal Service uh, had uh, broken the law in ceasing to make certain post-retirement benefit payments uh, into, into funds for a limited period of time and what impact that had on what the employees were earning at the time or not. I mean, this is essential to understand the plain language of the law, what OLC ultimately told the Postal Service was fine, and we wanted to know their reasoning. And like, uh, like Amy mentioned earlier, we're the committee that has the oversight of the Postal Service and the legislative uh, authority of the Postal Service. And we're saying, we want to know how you guys reached this conclusion that's really important to us. And we had to, we had to go through a significant fight to get it. Uh, it's, it's, it's something which I think does bear more investigation into how we can ensure that you know, the, the, the government's interpretation of the law is not hidden behind so that they can just sort of pretend like there's a good reason for the plain language will not be violated. Corey, I don't know if you can speak to this, but as far as the Snowden revelations and all of that that's happening with national security and transparency, what was the reaction in the international community on the Open Government Partnership? Did that influence the U.S.'s thinking on the national action plan? I know the administration takes these concerns very seriously. Um, it's not something I work on directly, and it means I can't speak to it in a very meaningful way, unfortunately. I, I know it's something that I have a lot of colleagues working on, working closely on, and it was certainly something that came into uh, our, our inclusion in the National Action Plan. I think some of you saw that there were some commitments related to this space um, based on what we could realistically do and, and ways that we intend to, as an administration, be more open. Um, and if you have specific comments or questions on this, as I said, because it's not something I work on, I may not be able to give you a very fulsome response, but I'd be glad to take it back to and share with my colleagues who, who do work on these issues. So I think one of the big elephants in the room, whenever you're talking about FOIA, and this came up again yesterday at FOIA Day, uh, several FOIA officers from within the government stood up and said, you know, all of this reform talk is great, but if you don't give us more resources, we can't improve. Um, and I had seen this, I'd received a call from someone on the Hill asking me about the discrepancy between FOIA processing efficiency at uh, the Department of the Interior and at the EPA. And both of these agencies have about the same number of FOIA processing staff. One of them receives double or almost triple the requests as the other. And so there's a vast discrepancy in the processing time. Um, so are there any prospects of increasing funding for FOIA offices? Is there a way that money can be reshuffled around so that there are greater resources or we can more efficiently use the resources that are there? Well, I guess at least the prospects for more uh, funding for FOIA would come to, uh, would be ours <laughs> to deal with. Uh, you know, neither of our bosses uh, serves on the Budget or Appropriations Committee, but I think everybody knows we're working under uh, budget agreement right now. Um, we're attempting to return to regular order through the congressional appropriations process. And Chairman Issa supports the budget agreement. Uh, Chairman Issa has been advocating for a return to regular order um, and to get away from continuing resolutions. Uh, I think you have 535 members of Congress, give or take a few, at any point in time. And so you have that many uh, opinions on what is the priority that should 
should be spared or needs more resources. Um, it's, it's just like when we're talking about changing the culture of government that afflicts FOIA, uh, you, you've got to talk about FOIA and its problems in the context of the uh, other problems that we're facing right now as a country and as a government. Um, I do think that it's important to look at reforms uh, to the statute, reforms to the process, and work on advancing those reforms, even when we're in a place where budgetary challenges cannot be immediately addressed, because uh, there's, there's absolutely ways to make sure that the reforms are going to save agencies, save the taxpayers money in the long run. So I, I think one thing on this is uh, dollars in and FOIA don't always equal dollars out. Uh, so there, there's smart uses of FOIA resources and there, and there are bad uses of FOIA resources. Uh, I recently got a response back from the Department of State, and they spent $12 on sending me uh, a registered, like, express copy of, of a report that, that, I, that I requested when they could have just emailed, to it, emailed it to me for free. Uh, so, you know, they're, they're smart spending on FOIA. And I think that one of the things that we're really missing is um, I don't think agencies are, are doing a good job of, or at least not in any way that, that then becomes public, of how they're using their FOIA dollars. Uh, the, the statistics that are kept by the Department of Justice are not very useful, uh, and so you know I, I hope that agencies are doing a better job of um, actually tracking whether or not they're they're putting their money um, toward good uses of, of uh, towards good uses. But I, I don't have any way to know that for sure. I, I don't know if I bet your uh, your twelve dollars that agencies are uh, putting tracking their own resources internally, very smart. Um, but this is, this is actually, that's a really, really, really great point and gives another chance for me to plug a bill that uh, our bosses are working on, and working on with the Senate right now, the Data Act, which the exact goal is to provide more of that granularity of where are the resources going in internal agency spending. Um, and it's a tool as much for the public to be able to say, outside groups to be able to say, we think the agencies are spending money inefficiently, as it is for Congress. You know, uh, the legislative branch has many fewer staff than any major executive branch agency, and we're talking about dealing with the entire government. So um, we're trying to level the playing field in terms of being able to give authorizing and oversight committees and appropriating committees that type of granularity and understanding of where the money is going so that maybe we can start to, to help tackle problems like this. And a lot of the efforts that we're undertaking administratively that I've already mentioned in the labor speak to this as well, ways to reform internal processes that can build efficiencies in and try and free up full-time employees to do more FOIA processing. I, I think the, the concept of a common regulation where that's not something people will have to sit down and rewrite every time, you know, it's there. Or the workshop series that we'll be hosting to build out some best practices Sounds like, in your example, one of those agencies has figured out some ways that really work well for it, as opposed to maybe some lessons that could be learned uh, from another agency. And that's what we're looking to do, put these people together so that we can share the strategy and leverage what we have and work with what we've got. Just sort of other, one more thing on this topic, and I think really speaks to the title of today's panel, The Future of FOIA. Um, when you're talking about what's going to really make an impact, we're all come back here for a reunion of this panel 20 years from now. Uh, the biggest thing that will make an impact is right now we start working on uh, the next generation of technological solutions to FOIA. Um, I know that as part of sort of the Department of Justice efforts, they're looking at the metadata for FOIA disclosures and to, so to ensure that you know private sector search engines, your Googles and your Bings, can more easily grab from wherever it's posted across the many .gov websites we have, uh, the FOIA responses that can be better indexed and cataloged. We, if we start thinking about how to create records with more metadata, we might be able to build systems that can more quickly and efficiently and to the extent possible automatically pull uh, the, those records during the discovery process and make FOIA processing something which is a lot easier to do, but I mean, we're, we're talking about 
devising a solution now that will take years to implement, but when it's done, we're going to really reap the benefits of it. That's a very good point, and, and that'll be more efficient not only for the agency, but also for the requester, because many requesters, especially commercial requesters, have to pay the search fees. So if an agency spends less time searching, then the requester is going to have to spend less money on the search fees. Uh, and on that Data Act point, I think that's really, really important. Um, I was in a meeting recently, and several others here were actually in the same meeting, and I was shocked to find out that it is nearly impossible to track the amount of money that agencies spend on FOIA litigation. Um, now, I'm a FOIA attorney. I bill out to the government when I substantially prevail in a case that's something above like $270 an hour. Now, I certainly don't get paid that much, but that's what my time is worth when I have to sue the government in order to obtain the documents that I've properly requested. Um, but it's, it's very hard as an outsider to track how much the agencies are paying out in litigation fees. And um, th there was actually a recent study by an academic that in order to get some sense of the cost of FOIA litigation, he actually had to go back and go through PACER records uh, to look at agency settlements in federal courts. And, and that's just crazy. There really should be an easier way to identify that information. Um, so on the subject of regulations, uh, and this one's especially for Corey and Amy, but others feel free to weigh in. How do we ensure, if we have these new uh, FOIA regulations that are going to be government-wide, that, that we don't end up with something worse than what we already have? That we don't end up with just a, a duplication of those very regressive DOJ regs that were proposed several years ago? Well, from, uh, from the open government community's perspective, and I know Ginger will be at the forefront of this also, we will, um, of course, be meeting with the people that are charged with, draw with drawing up the these regulations uh, quite a bit. We will be writing about them on our websites, and we will be raising hell if, uh, if anything bad comes out. <laughs> we don't want hell. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, and you know, this is something that we have, we as the administration have been discussing with our non-government colleagues for a while. This is um, something we're looking forward to doing and working together on, you know, something we We've been talking about it for months and talking about how we all want to work together on this process. It's going to be an interagency process. Uh, yes, the Department of Justice is leading it. Several other colleagues from across the agency will be working on this in the government space. We'll be certainly picking the brains of all of you quite regularly. Um, and we want to end up with something that is much more user-friendly and useful for everyone. Um, plain language is something that th this administration has embraced and that we all should embrace. And while regulations certainly do have a special language that we will need to adhere to from time to time, there are lots of ways that we can make the regulations more like the, the user manual that someone suggested and more user friendly for everyone. Uh, we don't need to be confusing our government colleagues or our requesters. So this is a chance for us to really build something that's going to be useful for everyone. We want your input, and if we're going off track, you know, steer us right back where we should be. It's certainly a really important issue. Uh, and those DOJ FOIA regs, which Epic actually commented on and the Sunlight Foundation signed on to those comments, uh, there were proposals not only just to allow agencies to lie to requesters about the existence of documents, but also to make it more difficult for news media requesters to obtain news favorable fee status, for educational institutions to obtain favorable fee status. I think one of the really prize-winning provisions in there was that uh, if you are a student and you are receiving credit for a course and you're making a FOIA request as part of that course, you do not qualify for that educational favorable fee status because you're receiving credit for the course. Um, so there were those bad fee provisions. Um, there's also a real refusal in those DOJ regs to recognize new media, uh, so, so bloggers and those sorts. Uh, so those are the sorts of things that we really don't want to see in a universal government-wide FOIA regulation. Um, so, I have to ask Krista and Ali, because I have friends who would just be very upset with me if I didn't ask this question, uh, are there any proposals or measures to increase congressional transparency? <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, that's outside the jurisdiction of the Oversight Committee. I mean, there certainly are, I mean, there are bills introduced every Congress, for example, to make CRS reports available to everybody. Um, you know, I know there's, I'm sure there are other things, but that's 
I mean, our legislative jurisdiction doesn't cover the legislative branch. Yeah, that's outside of sort of chairman, acts and ranking members becoming just current roles uh, with the way they're heading up uh, the oversight committee. Um, yeah, aware of the CRS report. Um, you know, it's somewhat related. It's transparency, but I know that this committee's moved the access to congressionally mandated reports act, um, which is a, a bit of a hybrid, I guess, of congressional executive branch transparency. Um, so something that we also like to see the House uh, take up. Um, yeah, but I, I, I know that certainly uh, just putting on the Congressional Transparency Caucus hat, that's an issue that um, that we've explored in the past and be interested in exploring in the future and hearing ideas for Congressional Transparency as well. So my final question, and then we'll open it up to audience questions uh, for Corey uh, and Malia and Krista, is how can we, as an open government community and as advocates, aid the administration and Congress in improving transparency? So uh, this is a, a comment I mentioned last week at a similar event, and I, I really think it's my biggest ask of all of you. There are, are so, FOIA is not without its problems. We know. We've talked about some of them today. We know what they are in government. You all have identified them for us as well. But there are a lot of things that go right in FOIA and that go well for you. And we in government don't necessarily hear about those things. We do hear about the problems. And it helps us to hear when things do go well. Um, it's, it, it's heartening for the FOIA staff who are working on these issues day in and day out. They want your support. Um, I, I find it great that they were at the AU event and talking about some of, talking openly about some of the problems that they encounter and asking for your support in that way. And I think that, that shoring that up for them is something that you all can do in your various roles as requesters, as our partners in the NGO community, in Congress, um, and, and helping agencies hear about things that they did right. All right, so we'll go ahead and open it up to audience questions. I think there should be a microphone around here somewhere. I'm turning it on right now. All right, great. Matt has the microphone. That's All right. Got one right here. Yeah. Um, okay, just I don't think I need the microphone. Our company deals with FOIA, and we have 8,000 FOIA professional end users. Those FOIA professionals are some of the most dedicated federal employees that we've seen. If you ask them where the bottleneck is, it's not them because they're the conduit, right? They get the question, they need to receive the information but they can't get the information. So how do you give this conduit some teeth to go back to the agencies and say, I've asked for this, give it to me. That's where a huge bottleneck is. So how do we overcome that bottleneck? It sounds like you're, okay, help me make sure that I'm tracking what, what you're posing here. It sounds like you're talking about the relationship between a FOIA office and the program offices within an agency, and there which, right. Um, especially, I, especially in records management. So if I dial back to my NARA years and put that hat back on, um, those are issues that we worked on very closely at OGIS um, and, and within NARA generally. I know that OGIS has worked with agencies uh, directly and specifically and then kind of overall and generally to help identify some of these bottlenecks and these issues where the communication maybe could use some improvement between the FOIA office and the program office. And I know that's something that that office is, is really working on constantly, um, just trying to help agencies improve those dialogues and relationships. I'd say that another way that, that we, we as an administration can assist with that is by these sorts of leadership memos and initiatives reminding that everyone in government is responsible for FOIA. It may not be your day-to-day -day job, you may not be the 0306 I mentioned, um, but you are in your own way responsible for carrying out FOIA administration. So uh, a memorandum from your leadership, um, specialized training that DOJ is putting together, there are various ways that we can together help these agency mission professionals, if you will, understand the role in the FOIA process and, and appreciate that. Well, you know, there's some states that actually have a civil fine for the individual who's required to provide the information to the FOIA office. They that. find that person individually. Those are some real teeth because now that conduit professional, FOIA, FOIA professional, 
can actually say, you haven't provided it to me, that person gets a fine. Now you're talking about no roadblocks. And I just think that's, that's I mean, you guys are talking about up here in the clouds and these big issues, but you know, down in the weeds where these people are facing these issues daily, they need help. Because if they get the help, then the bottlenecks go away, and now everybody files their report on time, and there's more access, there's more openness, because that's where the holdup is. So I just, you know, you all should think about some kind of way to, to, to let those bottlenecks through, because that's the biggest issue. Thanks. So, in addition to fines, which is something the open government community has suggested, and I had much uh, interest uh, in from the, from, the, from uh, Congress, we've also talked a lot about um, requiring that uh, FOIA performance be part of everybody's job review. Uh, so, if uh, somebody in a program office isn't responding to a FOIA officer that actually shows up in their in their performance view, review at the end of the year, that's certainly a way to uh, get them to be a little bit more responsive. That's that's another. Uh, idea that we've thrown out that hasn't gotten much uh, much of a warm reception um, in, in Congress yet. And I think that uh, another thing that agencies can do, though, uh, and, and this is actually part of the House bill, is uh, making better use of chief FOIA officers. So the 2007 law created this uh, senior senior position in agencies called a chief FOIA officer. Uh, and the idea behind the chief FOIA officer was it was supposed to be somebody at a high level who has responsibility for FOIA. Uh, and in some agencies, we, we've seen this work really well, because when a high level person has responsibility for it, then they're more likely to demand that uh, people uh, respond to FOIA offices, and uh, then, then things work better. In a lot of agencies, though, we have ended up, uh, it's just the chief FOIA officer is another, another title, another hat that's put on somebody else. So the other people who are only nominally interested in and, and how things are working. Oftentimes it's the privacy officer. Right, the privacy officer. Uh, so the, the House bill does create a Chief FOIA Officers Council, uh, which uh, would require all these Chief FOIA officers to actually uh, come to a meeting. If, I think it's, I, I'm not sure how often the meetings are, but they would at least have to be engaged in the FOIA realm, and it creates a space where they could actually uh, share uh, some tips for uh, how they're making their FOIA offices work. Uh, and that's definitely a provision that, that we are supportive of. This also seems like a really great topic for a future FOIA roundtable uh, or for the interagency working group. I do actually have to say that the House bill does include a provision regarding performance. Um, so it does have language that says that if an uh, agency employee doesn't properly implement FOIA, it can be used as the basis for a disciplinary action. Um, but I think to your point, it's more that it's making sure that we're not focusing only on the FOIA officials, but on the program staff who are actually responding, getting the information to the FOIA officers. And that, I mean, it seems like that has to be a, a directive for management. That's got to come from the management of the agency to make responding to FOIA requests a priority and making sure, and I mean, it's in real life, you know, it's, it's hard. These people, you know, they may be out in the field doing investigations. I mean, they're handling you know, a hundred different things, but just making it a, a cultural response in the agency that they're responsive to the FOIA officers. Thank you. Morgan, uh, uh, Kevin Davis, uh, We run a, a data technology platform that we use to power our website. And, you know, on both sides, there's both the request for the FOIA and then how you actually get the data, assuming you actually get it. So that's extremely frustrating for us is we'll kind of send something through the mail on paper. So the single the single platform would be a great place to a single portal where we could go through that. Uh, and then we'll get back CDs, which my computer doesn't even have a CD drive, so that doesn't really help us a lot. Um, you have you're, you're driving towards this single portal and you know this goes to what Amy said. Why isn't she getting a, an email with the file, right? What can we do, or how can we move towards something where you already have this really good platform, data.gov, which is actually quite good uh, in providing data towards where anyone requests a FOIA, if that request goes through, that data is just put on data.gov, and I get a link to the page where that is, or even if it's an agency website. You know, are there any steps being taken to move towards something like that, where I don't need to worry about getting CDs or even email the file? Uh, that file just becomes, it's, the work has been done, and this could cut down on cost. The work has been done to create that file. Can we just put it on an already existing platform that you guys have built with the government uh, to provide that to everyone uh, after a single FOIA request from one individual? 
There are agencies that are actually doing that already. Um, the Department of State, I think Commerce and EPA and some others are already taking steps toward that. And it's something that we've discussed, I, I know with members, with staffers on the Hill, uh, that, this, uh, that idea. Um, and I know in regulations frequently we've suggested that at very least, the requester should be able to request what format they want that document in. It, yeah, I just say something very similar, that this is happening in for many agencies, um, agencies who are partners with Employee Online, that's something, that, something that they're doing. Um, other agencies with their own similar systems are also putting records out that way. Um, and it's, it's all on the table for this, this consolidated portal. As I mentioned, this initial period will be a chance to absorb everything, all the user needs and asks, and um, that's definitely something that we'd like to discuss more, how that would work. Has uh, legislation been considered to force, whenever one FOIA request comes in, not three from different people, just put it up there? Well, I guess more to your original question, I can I can tell you that um, it might be a bridge too far. It's probably a bridge too far in this legislation mm -hmm. to create some sort of mandate that you know if it was already an electronic file, turning it into a printout document and then sending it is abhorrent, and people should be uh, immediately fired for doing something. So <laughs> but I can tell you, if it was up to Chairman Issa by himself, he would put that edict out there. Um, there's actually nothing. It's not the FOIA request, but in terms of the congressional request, there's nothing that frustrates. Than getting boxes and boxes of documents. Uh, you look at, if you look at every single request letter we've ever sent out, it says we want the documents electronically because he, obviously we know that that's how they are uh, created and that is how they are stored. Um, uh, so it's it's definitely something that I think we consider going forward, and I think the, the community can do a lot by just sort of you know the, the public shaming of agencies that are doing sort of the real bad practices on that hopefully to make a big impact. We have actually seen a good bit of improvement by agencies on this point. Uh, maybe because it is expensive for them to print things out and ship them. Um, it, especially, it, it's kind of funny because we'll request something, it's a PDF, they print it out, they ship, pay the money to ship it to us, we receive it, and what do we do? We immediately scan it in, in, into a PDF. Um, but there has been some movement on that. More and more of what we're receiving are either CDs or emails with multiple attachments with the documents in them. So we absolutely think that that's the way of the future and the way that the federal government kind of has to go. And, it, and part of it also goes back to this resource question. Uh, so we know that um, agencies are actually processing the same documents over and over again, or the, or the, or the same uh, data, data sets. And well, we know this because sometimes they make different decisions <laughs> about what they're going to withhold or release, and you know that's kind of embarrassing for the government. But it also it shows that um, they're wasting a lot of resources re reprocessing or a uh, document that, that should already be gone. You know, right now uh, when a record goes out, it, it's kind of a one-on-one -on -one transaction with 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 the requester, and people can just you know they can take those those documents that they've gotten back, put them in a drawer, and just lock them away and leave them in there, and maybe they're going to be buried with them. Like we don't know what they do with them. If, if the government's already gone through all the trouble of making the, these records okay for the public to, to, to have, then the public should have them. It's, it's, a, pu it's a public access law, and, and, and that's what we need, is um, more information to get out to the public. Now on the other side, there is some pushback on the press side uh, to want to have exclusive access to a document, at least for some short period of time. I'm sympathetic to that as someone who deals frequently with the Times and the Post. I know if I have a set of documents and I take them to someone at the Times, the first question they ask me is, have you shared these with anyone else? So I think I think there, though, is, is a way to mitigate that, to, to make it a three-day delay or a, a week-long delay. I know the Department of State, I think they release huge bundles of records quarterly. And, and so there, there is a way to sort of work in everyone's interests. Next. And uh, we have about five minutes left, so. I represent FOIA requesters, citizens, and nonprofit groups, public interest groups. And I want to speak on behalf of the frustrated FOIA requester. I see this frequently. Uh, citizens who have been told to make a FOIA request or, or try to seek information. The very long delays, you need to look at it from the perspective of the citizen, of the member of the public. And the de delays can be extremely long followed by denials 
I hear the frustration of these citizens about the process, and so I don't, I don't want you all to go away without understanding what's really going on out there in the real world. The State Department, I saw one, it was over a year, no response. I pressed for a response, so they denied the request. <laughs> a year and a half later, I mean, and this is the State Department that's advocating the Open Government, government Partnership internationally, and there are a lot of very frustrated uh, people trying to use this act who are frustrated by the delays and the denials. And that's certainly something I sympathize with. I was asked today by someone whether or not we ever receive a response within the statutory timeline, and I can't remember ever receiving a response from the agency within that timeline. I think the minimum is usually about three months, and that's if I'm requesting a very finite document. Uh, usually we have to go to court. And I had have, I have to laugh when Amy mentioned different documents being released with different redactions. One of my favorite FOIA stories is that I had requested um, back when the New York Police Department was surveilling Muslims and it came out, the Associated Press did an investigation. And it turns out that the CIA had an operative stationed in that office, which is a no-no because the CIA isn't supposed to be engaging in domestic surveillance. So the CIA Inspector General's office goes out to the press. They, they trot their press person out. And the press person says, Inspector General's looked into this. It's all good. Um, these are not the droids dro 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 you're looking for. <laughs> Nothing to see here. Move along. Uh, they don't release their report, so I quit it. Uh, didn't get a response from the CIA. Um, ended up having to sue them, went to court, got a hold of the executive summary of the Inspector General's report, almost wholly unredacted. Gave it to the Times, Times runs a front page story on it, I get an angry call at 10 p.m. from a reporter with the Associated Press, who was very upset because he made the exact same request and received back the exact same document, only it was almost wholly redacted. So, um, over there. Hi, good afternoon. My name is David Kruger, and uh, I'm with uh, a company that specializes in FOIA technology. Uh, first, I want to thank the panel. Just really terrific insight and comments about, uh, I think, this sort of generational change that perhaps uh, we have an opportunity both in terms of policy and technology as, as we move forward. Um, so as a technology vendor, I sort of see things through a technology lens, and so the two comments I really have are about uh, resources and access to information. So when we talked about, I think it was Ginger, you talked about a lot of FOIA requests are for uh, commercial contracts. I would extend that, it's also grants, so it's not just people out there making money and making donations to good causes, but it's uh, folks who are applying for grants to NIH and researchers, PhDs, et cetera. The same challenge of releasing those documents on a timely basis, so when we think about technology and transparency and how to deal with those issues and proactive disclosure and the assumption of openness. So the, everything's sort of tied together in terms of a systems perspective and, and uh, uh, Ali, you mentioned about uh, it's gonna take years to, to get to next gen and I'd like to say we're already doing R&D on next gen and we already have ideas on how to build systems that will enable proactive disclosure. So imagine if all the folks applying for health and human services grants are using a standard document where fields are already tagged with metadata that says this is cost information or this is proprietary information. And as soon as, soon as a contract is awarded, it could be pushed out to a, a, a centralized web portal or multiple web portals um, where the, the sensitive and information that truly deserves to be redacted, cost or proprietary information, but the rest of its statement of work, how it was decided, evaluation points, all that stuff should be able to seamlessly make it out to the public for consumption. Um, in, terms, in terms of resources, so it's not just a labor hour issue, as Melanie has testified before, uh, I think both the House and, and Senate, the, the idea of using e-discovery type technology to help, as we all know, more and more of these requests are large, voluminous requests. I hate to think of the number of government or contract lawyers who sit there with piles and piles of printed out emails trying to go through to figure out which is the single thread in which they can finally have a re potentially responsive document and then think about redacting. So with the use of e-discovery technology, which leading vendors are already bringing to the marketplace and federal agencies are already investing in, you can quickly scoop through these large voluminous <coughs> emails, whittle them down to the respective or perspective uh, responsive documents, redact them if, if need be. So, um, uh, 
the, the health of the system, its policy, its technology, its resources, its access to information, and as, as a technology vendor, we look forward to being engaged in this discussion about the future for and the next generation. And again, I applaud all the participants in the panel today. I think we have one more question. Have you ever looked at the Exemption 5 and its relationship to the interagency files? Government is increasingly working between and among agencies and groupings to deal with international issues on a daily basis. If Exemption 5 were to be literally interpreted, it would block any disclosure of anything dealing with many international government initiatives. And the, the question would be also related to trade agreements. For instance, uh, President put out EO 13609, getting with international regulatory cooperation. If the government is to be, uh, could put itself out there as the exemplar of transparency and expect the same in reciprocity from other governments into which it enters arrangements, agreements, uh, whatever your treaties, if you want to call them that, um, what are we to hope uh, from the current status of the FOIA delays and, and blockages, how are we supposed to convey to other countries how they're supposed to operate? Because our citizens are doing business in those other countries and will not be able to get any information at all because they, they operate under different systems. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? I know on the inter or intra agency question, it, it doesn't matter whether it's within an agency or within various agencies. It, that's not, it doesn't make a difference under the law. Um, there are still, even if you're dealing with inter or intra-agency documents, some areas where you can obtain the documents, if for instance it's a final decision or if it's purely factual material, uh, that shouldn't be protected under B-5. Uh, and the other important thing to remember about exemption B-5 is that it is discretionary. The agency can choose to give you those documents, unlike some of the other exemptions where by law the agency is not permitted to disclose the information. Under Exemption 5, the agency could choose to give you the information. Oftentimes they don't, but they have that option. I mean, there's a huge area of practice going on in the government with interagency action under interagency vehicles. So that means basically a large part of the government activity is is yeah, the that's exactly the problem with B5, is that it just it sweeps in a whole lot right, of Right, but it's different than it was 10 years ago. Very different than it was 20 years ago. Okay, international is, is commonplace. It's on, done on a daily basis. You enter into all these types of agreements, whether they be executive or treaty in nature. You have negotiations with international bodies. Now, I'm not sure, I don't know if anyone on the panel can speak to this, whether that inter or intra-agency sweeps in communications between other governments and our government. No, no, no. That's, a foreign, that's a foreign policy issue. I'm okay. talking about, let's assume there's an international body and they're trying to create international legal norms. Okay, obviously, those legal norms will end up bouncing back here for implementation purposes if there's a consensus. Okay, what are the bases for those, for the, for those decisions? Uh, the files that relate to those bases for decisions. And it's happening ever more than it ever did before which is why this area of government activity needs to have sunshine. Uh, because otherwise, we're going to be adopting laws to implement international standards, and we won't have any, any role in it at all. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. Thank you. So, um, do we have time for one more? It's up to you. All right, one more. Real quick. Yeah. Real quick. Uh, comment question. Um, the comment is, um, I was the father of regulations.gov in comparison to what happened in 1999 with paper file cabinets. It was a pretty significant change in uh, open government. Um, and the reason I raise this is that we had lots and lots and lots of issues that I would call management related, like the system architecture, um, functionality, uh, all kinds of interagency behaviors and some of things. And we had a very hard time finding anyone in Congress that would give us assistance, guidance, or care about it, except the appropriators who didn't want to spend any money on it. But I'd say this as a comment, and I think I would, my advice to both Krista and Ali is that um, you ought to ask questions, and you ought to be involved in things that seem somewhat mundane, but really aren't, when, you, when it comes to the creation of a government-wide system of any kind, especially in the FOIA case. My question, Laura, is that um, in an earlier life, I have spent a significant amount of time 
at a senior official level in government agencies in monitoring and being involved in and helping redact large volumes of very high profile FOIA requests. I've also been on the other side as the recipient of those documents and seen what the redactions are. So while we can all talk about the IT systems, the speed, the culture change, the nitty gritty quality of the FOIA request is what really to me counts. And so whether my only recourse is a lawsuit, my question to you guys is, you know, I look at a document and there's a phrase that's redacted and it says it's pre-decisional, but it looks to me like it's really just an embarrassing, disparaging comment about a member of Congress. <laughs> what do I do about that? So how do you get the FOIA system to actually produce redacted documents that are legitimately redacted, documents that you know they did indeed go back and search the archive for the emails, not just what's on the current employee's hard drive, without your necessarily specifically reminding them they need to do that. There's all those little things that are part of the system that don't work well and are almost impossible to, in a regulatory sense across the government, demand. And I don't know if it's training, I don't know whether it's like you fire the employees, I don't know what you do. So my question to you is, can we get at these things that really deal with the quality of what the agency produces? I think part of that is is increasing OGIS's role, or, or at least that's what we, we hope will be the result of an increased role of OGIS. I know there have been studies recently on the potential role of mediation uh, in FOIA, but one of the problems that's presented there, especially if you're dealing with information that might have national security ramifications, is that anyone who's reviewing those redactions has to have a high level clearance. So that itself presents a bit of a, a problem. And, and certainly one of the largest problems under the FOIA is that requesters, the, the typical requester who isn't set up to litigate, once they get the agency denial of their administrative appeal is pretty much screwed. I mean, there's not really much else that you can do. Um, we're hoping again that, that OGIS will be able to step up and take a role in that you know, with increased funding and enforcement ability. Um, but it is a very large problem that is inherent, it seems to me, in the act itself. Oh, this is a great solution. Um, <laughs> not that I'm biased. Um, but I, you pointed to, I think, the, maybe the most right answer, which is training. Um, making sure that the employees who are charged with carrying out this law know what it entails. And you know, we, we, all we can do is keep providing that education to FOIA professionals and giving them the tools that they need to properly carry this out. I, my direct personal experience, what I'll tell you, is that a lot of the redactions that are done in high-profile cases are being done usually with an agency's general counsel involved, and that usually means the political level. And the training isn't going to change that behavior. And that goes back to the culture issue, which we discussed earlier. And, and I mean, we start, this is a huge problem. A few years ago, it actually came out that some of the agencies were deliberately kicking requests with political potential political undertones off to the front office for political review. Um, it's, a, it's a big problem. It's something that we've certainly advocated against, and not just because we were on the list and our requests were being kicked off for additional review, but because that's just an inherent flaw in the system. This, it was not designed to protect agencies from embarrassment. It was, the exemptions were not designed for that. I think, again, that's an area where oversight comes into play. So if you're talking about it, more specifically the Department of Homeland Security, I mean, what came out in the committee's investigation of that particular situation was it wasn't a political review. It was, you know, something that was, it was a, a flaw in the process of how they were doing it once the committee, you know, conducted interviews and had an investigation, DHS actually changed their process. Um, and streamlined it so that things weren't getting caught up in the process. So I think that part of it is being able to bring it to you know, our attention in Congress isn't certainly, I mean, OGIS plays a much bigger role and it's, everything doesn't need to come to Congress, but I think that's an additional tool is to, you know, if there's a particular problem, bringing it to our attention so that we can ask questions about it. Yeah, and as a requester, we're very grateful. For, for the Oversight Committee and all of the work that it's done on this. Ali, I'm sorry, did you have another comment? I mean, maybe, maybe not to the specific thing about uh, stuff going to the front office, and obviously that remains a very big concern for Chairman Issa, um, and, and something he hopes to continue in his time as Oversight Chairman, uh, looking at and pushing forward. Uh, but to your question of that cultural change, and we've talked about it, the government-wide problems, um, I, I do think, you know, one of the things Chairman Issa would return to is the technology of the of the, the creation and keeping of records um, to the extent that we can start to make some of this stuff automatic, we sort of push the folks at the agencies forward to understanding that you know this is the these.
documents belong to the people, and uh, you know there are limited exemptions as to when the people is, cannot be shared publicly. But uh, otherwise, this is these are the people's documents, and they ought to be available for them. So on that note, I just wanted to thank again Krista and Ali for their great work on the Oversight Committee, uh, Corey for her great work with the White House, Amy for being a fantastic advocate for transparency. Um, all